Hello, and welcome to Astro 101, The Sun and Its Neighbors. I'm Professor Barton Netterfield. Today, I want to help us try to understand the size of the universe and where we are within it. Now, I think for most people, the universe is kind of this vague and fuzzy thing. We have, we know there's the sun and the earth. We know something about the earth orbits the sun. There's other planets that also orbit the sun maybe. And we know some of them like Mercury and Jupiter or something and Venus, I guess. Then we know there's other stars. And if you don't live in Toronto, you've been outside the city, you've seen other stars. I guess on a clear night in Toronto, you can see all seven stars, but there's more than that. Um, and we've heard of galaxies, but never really seen them. We've seen pictures of galaxies, but don't really know what a galaxy is. And we know that galaxies are somehow, well, they're in space, something, something. And we know they're spacecraft. A spacecraft are doing something out there and they're traveling and taking pictures and something. And they look like these cool things with dishes. And my hope for this course and for today is for us to really be able to walk away with a firm understanding of how this all works. What is the sun? Where are we with respect to the, to the sun and the planets and the stars? We're going to do that. Today, I want to help us understand the scale of the universe, the scale and the size of the universe. So what's the first step? Well, the first step is to go ahead and look up all the sizes and distances in the solar system. So here we are, here's a table um, of the sizes and distances of the universe. And if you want, you can go look this table up yourself um, in on Wikipedia. That's a great source for just kind of general knowledge. Now you can't use it as a reference, um, but certainly if you just want to look numbers up, it's a great place to look them up. So here we have the first column is uh, the objects, the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. The second column is their radius. The radius is the distance from the center to the edge. Okay, there's the radiuses starting with the Sun and going up to ne Neptune. Okay, and then the distance from the Sun. The Sun, of course, is zero kilometers from the Sun. That's easy to understand. But the rest, these are just really big numbers. Lots of digits, lots of commas. And I look at these numbers and I just cannot picture them. And I don't know about you, can you picture these numbers? So we would really like to somehow put the, these sizes into context. How can we understand these sizes? How can we understand these scales? So um, I, apparently Sue and Janelle have, um, ah, Sue and Janelle, um, you have a model of the solar system for yes, us. Yes, we do, and it is all laid out. And here, representing the sun, is a cantaloupe. And these four coffee ground bits represent Mercury, Venus, Earth, your home, and the moon. And here is Mars. And these blueberries represent Jupiter and its major moons and Saturn. Hey, is that a ring? Yes, it is. Saturn has beautiful rings. And these peas represent Uranus and Neptune. That is really cool. And this is all to scale? Yes, it is. One to ten billion. But the spacing isn't actually accurate because we don't have enough room in the house. However, my handsome husband has gone to Centennial Park and he will show you this to scale. Well, that's really great. Thank you, Susan and Janelle. That was super helpful. Wow, wasn't that cool? So now we have a sense of the relative size of the planets. This column right here, the radius, the radius being the distance from the center of the planet to its edge. So instead of saying that the sun has a radius of 696,342 kilometers, we say that the sun has a radius of something like 6.9 centimeters or about 14 centimeters in diameter. The same with all these planets. So Mercury shows up as being that little piece of coffee ground about a half a millimeter across, or Venus and Earth being about a millimeter across, Mars being a little less than a millimeter. It's incredible how small the Earth is compared to the Sun. There's this really cool picture, you can find some of these online. It's a render of the Sun and all of the planets to scale. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mar Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then here we have Pluto and the other dwarf planets. If you're a big fan of the dwarf planets like Pluto, 
here they are. They are absolutely tiny. And the, the thing that is really impressive to think about, imagine that you're sitting here on the earth, in your city, in your house, sitting in front of your laptop or your computer watching this video, and think about how small you are compared to the earth, and then how small the earth is compared to the sun. It is, it is aston astounding. The sun is, now the sun doesn't seem that big. When you look at the sky and you say, well, it's this little dot. It looks small because of how incredibly far away is it? How far away is it? Well, from the earth, it's 149,597,890 kilometers away. Again, that is a number I just cannot picture. But Susan said her husband had taken the scale model up to uh, Centennial Park uh, out in the border of Mississauga and Etobicoke to try and give us an idea of the scale, how to picture these sizes. So let's go ahead and go to Susan's husband and see what he's got for us. Wait, you're me. How does that make any sense? Well, I don't know that it does, but we did decide to put it in the script, so I say we just go with it. All right, so you brought the scale model up to Centennial Park Hill. Yes, that's exactly right. Here we have a one ten billionth scale model of the sun. That is to say, this cantaloupe is 10 billion times smaller than the sun. So we're going to shrink everything by 10 billion in order to try and picture the, the scale and size of uh, the solar system. In the solar system, if this is the sun, then the nearest planet to the sun would be right over here, Mercury. Now, Mercury um, takes uh, about 80 some days to orbit the sun. It is uh, here. It's just a little tiny speck of, of rock. The next planet after Mercury over here is Venus, also orbiting the sun. And then after Venus, going even further out, we come to our very favorite planet in the whole universe, and that is the Earth. Um, now, it takes light eight minutes to make it from the sun to the Earth. So if we look at the sun, we see it like it was eight minutes ago. Th that's right, but you probably shouldn't be looking at the sun without proper eye protection. Now, it takes the Earth about one year to orbit the sun. After the Earth, we come to the last of the inner planets, and that is Mars. Mars is this little speck of, of dirt right there. So the four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then Mars. And is there anything else between them? Space. Lots and lots of space. And not anything else? Not really. I mean, you could take one of these little rocks and crumble it up into powder and spread that out all around, and that would be the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt. So mostly nothing. Wow. Now, after the inner planets, we come to the outer planets. And the outer planets here, um, we have here at the bottom of the hill, my wonderful wife Susan, ah, who Sue. is holding Hi. Jupiter. Um, Jupiter is a uh, blueberry. After Jupiter, we have Saturn. There's Janelle with Saturn. Hello, Janelle. Hello, Another Saturn. Blueberry. After Saturn, we have Uranus. And then finally, out by the goalposts, Neptune. Wow. And Neptune is that P. And you can barely even see where Dawn's holding it. Now, if we look at this, these distances are enormous. Now, the sun's not the only star in the sky. How close, can you show us where the nearest star to the sun would be in this scale model? Oh, no, I can't. It's much too far. But maybe you should call Sophia. All right, let's call Sophia. Ah, Sophia, uh, where are you right now? I'm in Chilliwack, British Columbia. And you're holding the nearest star to the sun? Yep. That's Alpha Centauri, right? Mm-hmm. And there's nothing between here and there? Nope. Wow, that is incredible. Thank you so much, Sophia. Have a great week. Okay, let's get this. We said here that when we scaled everything down by a factor of 10 billion, we said that the sun in this scaled model would be the size of a cantaloupe. And then we said that the Earth was a, like a millimeter across, like on one of those tiny little grains of coffee ground or something. And that Neptune is a pea a half a kilometer away. And in this scale model, the nearest star to the sun is all the way 
in British Columbia. And in between us and them is nothing. Space. Now, I think, I don't know, have you, have you ever been out at night and seen this, the Milky Way? This is an absolutely astounding sight. And if you've never been outside the city on a dark night and let your eyes dark adapt and then looked up at the sky and seen this, I really encourage you to. It's an incredible sight. Now, what you see when you're looking at this is this band going across the sky of stars. It looks like it's a cloud. It looks like dust. It's not. Those that glowing is individual stars. 100 billion individual stars glowing forming what looks like a cloud. Now, think about the size of this thing, right? Remember the spacing. The There's the sun, which is the cantaloupe here in Toronto. And then there's the nearest star to the sun, which is that large grapefruit or melon in British Columbia. And then a hundred billion more. One in China, one in India, and a hundred billion more, all spaced like this. And a hundred billion of them, so it looks like a cloud that's glowing in the sky. There's other galaxies in the sky. Um, the nearest galaxy to the sun is called Andromeda, um, or the, the Andromeda galaxy. This galaxy is qualitatively a lot like our galaxy. It's a cloud of something like a hundred billion stars. And when you look at it, it looks like it's just glowing like a cloud. It's not. These are individual stars. Instead of little droplets of water in a cloud, these are individual stars, a hundred billion of them. Well, how can we understand a hundred billion stars? How can we understand a hundred billion of anything? Well, here we have a picture in the dump truck, not on the, in the pile, but in the dump truck, we have 100 billion grains of sand. The number of grains of sand in this jump truck are about the number of stars in a galaxy. So when you think about the Milky Way galaxy, think about all those stars. How many stars are there? Well, there's the number of stars as there are in the dump truck. Absolutely unbelievable. So where are we? In, we, have, we imagined ourselves on the Earth, the Earth orbiting the Sun, eight other planets orbiting the Sun. If we scaled things down by a factor of 10 billion, then the nearest, then the sun becomes a, a cantaloupe, the earth becomes a millimeter, little tiny little piece of coffee ground, and the nearest star to the sun is in British Columbia. But there's a cloud of 100 billion of these stars, one here, one in BC, one in China, and then 100 billion more. Absolutely astounding, astounding sizes. Now, I want to talk about something else which is really cool, and it's kind of out of the blue, and that is another way of starting to understand distances. Now, when we talk about distances, we often talk about distances in terms of what's called a light year. So the nearest star to the Earth, Alpha Centauri, is about four light years away. Now, what do we mean by light year? That sounds like a time, not a distance. Well, we can talk about here in Toronto, we might ask, well, how, how far away is London, Ontario. And somebody might answer, oh, it's about an hour and a half. Maybe two hours. Depends on how fast you're driving. Ah, oh, well, okay. How far away is Waterloo? Oh, it's about an hour. Okay, how far away is Montreal? About four and a half hours. You see, we're talking about distances in terms of time. How long it takes to get there. So when we talk about how far away the nearest star is, we do it in terms of light years. That's how long it takes light to get from Alpha Centauri to us. It takes light four years. To the center of our galaxy, it takes light something around 10,000 years. Unbelievable. Now what this means is something really magical. It means that we can see into the past. Let me explain this. So imagine here in some distant galaxy, a star explodes and it produces a flash of light. This explosion is called a supernova. You'll learn that about all this when you, if you take Astro 201. But today we just want to take it as given. A star explodes and produces this flash of light. And let's imagine this explosion happened one billion light years away. 
One billion light years away, there's a flash of light. Now, ar orbiting around the Earth, there's the Hubble Space Telescope, which has taken a picture of this galaxy. And the telescope at, around the Earth does not see the explosion because the light has not gotten here yet. So what do we do? Well, we wait. Let's wait 300 million years, okay? Now, I'm not going to do that real time. We'll just imagine we wait 300 million years. The explosion's all gone. It's done. We don't see the explosion yet because the light is still on its way. Don't see the explosion. So what do we do? We wait some more, another 300 million years. 600 million years later, the light is still on its way, still traveling at 300,000 kilometers per second. Hasn't gotten here yet. So we wait, finally, after a billion years, the light makes it to the Earth. The telescope around the Earth sees the explosion. We see the explosion one billion years after it happened. In other words, the farther away we look, the farther back in time we look, because light takes time to travel. It's so unbelievably cool. Now, we were talking about galaxies. We talked about the Milky Way galaxy. We talked about the Andromeda galaxy. We talked about this galaxy a billion light years away. There are a lot of galaxies in the sky. So this here is one of the coolest pictures I think that anyone's ever taken. It was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a NASA telescope that's been orbiting the Earth um, since the 1990s. Um, it's a two and a half meter telescope. You think about how big that is. That's, that's, that's enormous. And this is an exposure, which is something like a week long. I'm looking at one of the darkest parts of the sky with a two and a half meter telescope. So this, this part of the sky, normally we would think it's completely empty, completely dark. But when you sit there and you have the exposure collecting photons for days and days and up to a week, um, a total of a million seconds altogether went into this image you start to find that it is not at all empty. There's lots and lots of things in it. Now, if you take a look here, one thing you, you might notice right away is that some of the objects in this image really look like something we recognize from before, like galaxies, like here. That's, well, that's a galaxy. And these here, these are galaxies. These three things up here, look at, those are, those are three galaxies. Let's, let's zoom in around those three galaxies. Ah, here they are. These are galaxies, and oh, yeah, that's a galaxy, and there's a galaxy there and there, and wait. Zoom in some more, the galaxy, and that's a galaxy, and whoa. Uh, everything in this entire image is a galaxy. Now, let's remind yourself, what's a galaxy? A galaxy is a cloud of something like 100 billion stars, 100 billion stars, the number of grains of sand in a dump truck. Each one of these is a galaxy. Some of them are closer, some of them are farther. They are all galaxies. Now, the nearby ones, maybe a billion light years away. We're seeing them as they were a billion years ago. The more distant ones, five, 10 billion light years away. We are, it's taken light billions of years to get here from them. And so we are seeing them as they were billions of years in the past. Absolutely unbelievable. Now, another thing about these galaxies that we see is that every single one of them is moving away from us. Now, those are the galaxies in that direction. If you look in this direction, those galaxies are moving away from us in that direction. And galaxies over there, they're moving away from us in that direction. In fact, no matter where you look, in any direction, galaxies are moving away from us. It's kind of like we're in the center of an expanding universe. Very strange. Now, we want to somehow try to picture how many stars there are in the universe. How do we Picture that. How do we picture the number of stars there are in the universe? Now, if you take all the galaxies in here and multiply them out and count them, and then multiply the number of spots like this you can fit in the whole star, you conclude, the whole sky, you conclude that you can see a trillion galaxies visible from the Earth. A trillion. How do we picture a trillion galaxies? What's a trillion galaxies? Well, if you, well, a trillion galaxies is 10 dump trucks full of sand. That's a, a trillion grains of sand is 10 dump trucks full of sand. And each galaxy has 100 billion stars. So you can imagine that, well, the number of 
grains of sand in a dump truck is 100 billion. So we can try and put this together. Let's do this again. So let's, let's do this again. There are 1 trillion galaxies visible from Earth. Okay, so that is, so imagine 10 dump trucks full of sand, like so. Every one of those grains of sand is a galaxy. So the number of galaxies visible from Earth is the number of grains of sand in 10 dump trucks. Okay. Now, each galaxy is a cloud of something like 100 billion stars. So let's put that together. You look at one grain of sand in one of those dump trucks. You pull it up and you look at it and you realize that it's actually a miniature dump truck full of sand. And every one of the games of sand in the miniature jump, dump truck is a star. That's how we can picture the number of stars in the universe. A trillion galaxies, each with a hundred billion stars. Now, imagine trying to find the Earth in that. So my recommendation is you not ever get lost in the universe. It'd be really hard to find your way back. Now, turns out the traveling distances like that is basically impossible. We'll cover that more later as the semester progresses. But we can't take a trip through the universe just because you can never travel that fast, that far. Even traveling at the speed of light, it takes a million years. No, two million years to get to the nearest galaxy. It takes a billion years to get to the, some of the galaxy we're seeing in the, in, in the Hubble pictures. So, but what we can do is we can make a numerical a computer simulation of what the universe is like. So it, we know how gravity works. We know how matter works. So um, people have made simulations of how the universe behaves. And so here we're taking a trip through part of the universe. Each one of these little blobs here is a galaxy. Um, and we're traveling in between them. This is a tiny fraction of the visible universe, of course. Here we have a cluster of galaxies. A cluster of galaxies is a place where thousands of galaxies are all clumped together. Like thousands of galaxies, each with 100, million, 100 billion stars. I mean, incredibly, incredible objects. Um, the universe is enormous beyond comprehension. But we can have some sort of small picture of just what, of what it's like. Don't get lost in the universe. All right, so as we said before, the universe is expanding. We look at these distant galaxies. We see the distant galaxies are moving away from us. The farther away they are, the faster they're moving. The galaxies in that direction are going that way. Galaxies in this direction are going this way. Galaxies in this direction are going this way. It's like we're at the center of an expanding universe. So how do we make sense of this? So what does this mean? Now, the universe, the, remember this really cool fact that the farther away we look, the farther back in time we look because light takes time to travel. As we look at a distant galaxy, we see it like it was in the past. A more distant galaxy, even further into the past. Now, the universe is also expanding and cooling. If you take a gas and let it expand, it cools. If you play the tape backwards, in the past, the universe was far hotter and far denser. The universe is expanding and cooling. Now, cold, cold gas is transparent. You can see right through it. But if you heat gas up enough, it turns into what's called a plasma, like lightning or the surface of the sun. So as we look further and further away, we look further and further back in time to when the universe was hotter and hotter and denser and denser as we go further and further and further back in the past. So we look further and further away, back before the earliest galaxies, back when there was back before there was no, nothing at all until we finally come to this transition from when the universe went from a cold, the universe is now transparent. We look back to when the universe went, the transition from a plasma to a gas. So if you're following the story, you should be able to look at the sky and look in any direction and see the whole sky glowing like the surface of the sun. Now that doesn't actually work because um, of a thing called the Doppler effect. I mean, um, we may learn that later on the semester, but instead of being visible light, it gets transformed into millimeter wave light. So if you build a millimeter wave telescope and you point it at the sky and look in any direction, you can see the universe like it was very close to the Big Bang. Now, the really crazy thing is if you look a little bit further. So what we can do is use a millimeter telescope and look at the surface 
and see the universe like it was 13.8 billion years ago, just after the Big Bang. What's really interesting is if you try to look even further, you can't, because this blue band represents the beginning of the universe. If we look further than that, we look back before the beginning of time. You can't. That's the beginning of everything. So as you look further away, you're looking further back in time to when you see this transition from a plasma to a gas. We'll look, cover this a lot more next semester, but I just wanted to give, a, give you a pre brief idea. So this is a really cool picture taken by the Planck satellite. This blue stuff, blue and pink here in this band, this is dust in our galaxy. It's close to us. We're seeing it like it is now. But if you look behind to this red and orange stuff back here, this is that plasma, this plasma from the very, very early, early universe. Here we are looking back to the very beginning of time, 13.7 billion years ago. It's absolutely fantastic. So we've kind of got an idea today of our size in the universe. We live around a sun, um, along with the other planets. The planets orbit the sun. The sun, along with 100 billion other stars, lives in a galaxy. The galaxy is one of trillions of galaxies in the universe, which are all moving apart. We go beyond that and we see, um, we can trace back to the very beginning of time. Now, this is a really cool story. And something I didn't do at all, and you should be skeptical, not once did I tell you how I knew this. And if I just tell you a story, it doesn't really do you any good. The whole goal here is to understand how we know. Science is an epistemological system which objectively describes and predicts the behavior of the universe. And most importantly, it's a, it's a, a system which is testable. If you make a claim in science, you have to be able to test your claim or it's not scientific. So all these things I've said, I can tell you the tests we've done to prove that they're right. All these things we've said, I can tell you how we know them. I didn't tell you yet. But if there isn't, if we haven't tested it, if we haven't confronted the models with lots of different results, if there's anything that doesn't agree with the model, then you have to say this is not a good description. Everything I've showed you, the description is incredibly good. Every experiment, every observation we can make agrees with everything I've said, which is Phenomenal. And we're going to be talking about how we know all these things as the semester goes on. What is a scientific claim? So let's, let's, uh, let's try a, um, let's try an example. Consider two possible answers to the question, what happens when I drop a rock? All right. Two hypothetical answers. One, we could say the rock will immediately fly off into space. That's claim number one. And there's claim number two. The love of the earth for its child, the rock, will draw them together. Only one of these is a scientific statement. Now, one, at least one of them is also wrong, but only one of them, and demonstrably wrong, but a, only one of them is a scientific statement. Only number one, the rock will immediately fly off into space. That one is a scientific claim. It's objective makes a prediction, and we can test it. We can test everything about the statement. We can't test whether the Earth loves its child. We could test whether or not they come together, but we don't know why. This is not a scientific statement because you can't test everything about it. This, we can test it all. So let's go ahead and make a demonstration of this just for a little bit of silliness. So let's see here. Um, Ah, it's me again. Nice to meet you. Are you ready? I am ready to test the scientific claim that if I drop this rock, it will fly off into space. All right. Uh, wait, uh, what do you think is going to happen? Well, what I think is going to happen doesn't really matter now, does it? I guess not. Let's do it. Okay, here we go. Ah, I guess our prediction was wrong. Let's be honest here, we didn't actually think the rock was going to fly off into space, did we? No, that's because we have done this experiment many, many times. Over the course of our lives, we have dropped innumerable objects over and over and they again. they have always fallen. They have never flown up. 
Except helium balloons. Except for helium balloons. And rockets. And rockets. And airplanes. In any case, the way that objects in motion behave has been studied and experimented with to the point that our predictions are very, very good. These collection of experiments form what is called a scientific theory. And our scientific theories can predict we'll almost be talking about this as the course progresses, I presume? Uh, yes. Thank, thank you very much for your help. <laughs> My pleasure. In any case, what we just did here today was test a scientific claim. How do we know that if you drop an object, it falls? Because we've done the experiment. We know what happens when you drop objects. And that's going to be true about everything we study this semester. If we see something, if we make a claim, we have to be always asking, how do we know? And the answer will be because of some measurement that we made, some experiment that we did. So this is, this is going to be a really important thing. It's an important thing to take forward in your life. When you think about scientific truths, these are things which are testable. You can test them, and then you know they're true. In any case, that's the end for it for this lecture. Next lecture, we'll be taking a tour of the solar system. So I hope you'll be back for that, and uh, have a great week.